This message is brought to you by Unidragon. Have you ever encountered a wooden puzzle? You haven't? Well, let me enlighten you. Of the many activities you can do to fill the time, doing a jigsaw wooden puzzle is one of the most nostalgic and analog pastimes. It's a fun, low-stakes activity to help you slow down, stay in the moment, and reduce anxiety. Plus, it's just super satisfying to complete one. From Unidragon, they sell premium sets of wooden puzzles, exclusive puzzles that will fascinate you and make you fall in love with them at first touch. The magic of Puzzles Assembly is accompanied with the notes of a woody fragrance. The parts cutting is of extraordinary beauty. The puzzles are sophisticated and they present different, unique shapes. And they're basically small miracles in your hands. They're also eco-friendly ingredients. Natural paper, birch wood, with harmless and non-toxic glue. Now available in their shop is the Charming Owl, the Shinning Fish, Mysterious Lion, Majestic Wolf, and many more. Check out these puzzles at unidragon.com. That's U-N-I-D-R-A-G-O-N.com. Well, you always make mistakes in technology. (laughs) And making mistakes is nothing bad. So it often is regarded as that. I don't know why, but it's it's part of the learning process. And that's what I'm trying to, to tell everyone. Before we were doing, this a long time ago, but before we were doing all this stuff like Scrum and we were like doing this planning poker and doing estimations, which turned out to be a bit more like a gut feeling of estimations and no real estimate. And we kind kind of based our, let's say, our releases on that, which always fails or often fails. I'm Daniel Hauschild. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Imagely. This is Code Story, a podcast bringing you interviews with tech visionaries who share in the critical moments of what it takes to change an industry and build and lead a team that has your back. I'm your host, Noah Laphart, and today how Daniel Hauschild is steadily building the creative engine for the world of images. All this and more on Code Story. Daniel Hauschild lives in Germany, in a town called Bohom. He comes from a family of craftsmen, which means that he wasn't involved in tech at an early age. He stayed busy with friends and sports, more specifically archery, where he learned about patience, concentration, and competition. In his younger years, he clung to a longbow, but steadily moved towards using higher tech, a compound bow, in his later years. When he was 14 years old, he got into cracking video games, which led him down the path of coding and learning the assembly language. He recalls the first game he cracked was X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter. In 2008, his current company started out as an image hosting service for Twitter. You may remember seeing the links while using the social platform. When Twitter built their own, they pretty much shut down the first product. And during that time, many customers of the agency Nine Elements, which Daniel worked for, were asking for tools around image processing, resizing, etc., So they started building a tool to do those things. This is the creation story of Imagely. So basically we're building something like a mini Photoshop, a photo and video editing tool, which you can integrate into your own web application or app. So whenever you build something yourself, an application, it needs some tools for photo editing, maybe simple cropping to filtering and all that stuff. That's where we come in. Imagely itself, yeah, we see ourselves more like um, a tool company for creative tools. So we always strive to bridge the gap between technology and creativity. How did we start? We started like 10 years ago almost, because Imagely itself has been a totally different product in the beginning. Actually, we started like 2009, 2008. So we were basically an image hosting service for Twitter called Imagely, which was used by many people. Unfortunately, this wasn't that successful because Twitter decided to launch their own image hosting service somewhere around 2009, 2010. So this, this Imagely was kind of done. But why I'm telling that is because back then Imagely was still a product of a company which is called Nine Elements, which is also here, let's say, our, our mother company, which, which was or is still a digital agency, which came up with this Imagely idea. This was this image service. 
But then again, we had this experience which images ourselves and we are a design company for as long as I can remember. So what happened is shortly after is that some customers came to us and asked us if we had experiences building something around images, like image editing, image processing and stuff. And you could say this was the start of the image as we know it today, because we started then building a small, really small photo editing application for a consumer product for a customer. But back then, this was too expensive for the customer because you can imagine you have to put a lot of effort into creating such a tool if you want to have good UX and all that stuff. And so we made a deal. And so we kept the IP of all the photo editing stuff and just built the other rest of the product. That's how we started, actually. Then we decided, um, okay, maybe we can reuse this technology for other products. But we didn't, honestly, we didn't know what for or who might use it. So what we did is we decided to put it on GitHub, you know, this was the early days of GitHub and we put it there, it was the web SDK, actually the web version, just could do cropping, a bit of filtering and we put it there for as open source product, um, we didn't decide yet on any license back then, but what finally happened then, that shortly after, actually a big known company reached out to us, which was, which I can tell you, which was Amazon back then, and asked if they could have this product and integrate into their applications. And actually, this was where we realized that there might be more to it than just something we built, you know? Let's let's back up a little bit. Tell me about the MVP. Tell me about how long it took to build and what sort of tools you used to bring it to life. Basically, I would say we are forever MVP because we are always extending our product, but I know what you mean. So you have to know first that in our case, MVP means building multiple products because um, we have that same SDK for different platforms. And I can tell you about that. The web SDK was the first one. So if you would consider that the really first MVP, it was maybe two or three months at most. But you can imagine it was just cropping, just filtering, you know. We didn't use much of a tool, so we used vanilla JavaScript back then, no frameworks, no libraries. But really early, in the, after the really first version, we switched to React. We were really first adopters of React when it came to the web version for the UI and all that stuff. About that MVP, when you're building that, and I, I hear there's some technology changes in that, but there's you know there's always a trade-off or two that you have to decide um, and decisions that you have to make, whether it be feature cuts or or technology changes. Um, tell me about some of those. What decisions and trade-offs did you have to make in the short term, and how did you cope with those? I think the most interesting decision we had to take was when we built, let's say we started with web SDK, but it quickly became apparent that we would need also something for the mobile platforms like iOS and Android. And we had to make this typical decision, could we just use some JavaScript wrappers, which we then use on iOS and Android, or do we have to build it from scratch, or can we reuse code? And we had to decide quickly because those customers we had were, let's say, asking for the mobile versions. and. We back then made the decision that we have to build all three for all three platforms in their own version. So, for example, the web version is still and was this JavaScript based and with React, but the iOS version, for example, started with Objective C language, then we changed to Swift, and Android has Java. So you can imagine you there was a decision to make where to put your energy and which people you need to hire to actually be able to build all the different platforms. Yeah, absolutely definitely affects how you build your team, how you use your team, and how you do your roadmap. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. What triggered a lot of those decisions? And I know, you know, when Swift came out, obviously you got to support that. And when other languages come out, you got to support that. But what were some of the triggers that pushed some of those decisions to the forefront? So from the technology wise, um, it, for an SDK, you, you, you mentioned it, for an SDK, it's always important to support the latest and newest, right? Because there are new, new products coming out every day. Other developers we want to integrate our product and it should be as easy as possible. So for us, it's always important to be yeah, at the cutting edge of technology. That was one of the decisions we had to make. But generally speaking, so if you ask more about how we decide, how we make decisions, then it's a lot about uh, listening to our customers. From the start, I, I told you that in the beginning, a first customer came to us and uh, more or less told us that our product is useful for their use case. And yeah, that's really where we kept on going. So we build a website and ask people what features they needed, right? We talked to them. We had a lot of talks to bigger customers and smaller customers. And they said, hey, oh, your tool is great, but it would require us to have this and that feature. and so. We took all that and 
yeah, thought about that, looked at the market and yeah, started deciding on the feature set. That's great. And actually, that's a really great segue. So how did you progress the product and how did you decide what was the next most important thing to build? And I hear customer feedback, but dive into that a little more. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying customer feedback, but there's also a lot of, especially in the beginning, a lot of intuition, right? Because you look at that market, you look at the other applications that come out. So as we are an SDK, you can imagine that we could always think, okay, there are other apps which people want, want to imitate or they see some features in something like Instagram or, I don't know, Snapchat, and they may want to have the same for their application. So we are always looking at all these applications and how we use this worldwide use those. And it goes into our research, right? And then again, we, we think about uh, these new features and sometimes we prototype them even to get yeah, to hold on how much effort it will be, etc. But then we actually talk to customers, try to sell them the unfinished product. We, we talk to them and say, hey, we want to have this and that feature in the SDK. Do you need that? Or is it something you would also buy? And as soon as the customer tells us, or one or two or three, it depends that they want to buy is we kind of get a validation, right? We get a validation that is really useful and that we don't imagine something. And that's basically the core concepts how we work off. It's not always the case, but 90%, I would say, yes. Oh, that makes sense. So customer feedback, prototype, validation, more customer feedback, um, and then the whole cycle again. Yeah, and it's actually important that we work really close with new customers whenever we develop a new feature. So there's more more or less one or two exclusive partners at the beginning, which we partner with, and they have a real, have a use case, a specific one, and we talk to them, get their knowledge about the use case, build something, show it to them, they integrate it. You can imagine it goes back and forth until the feature is, let's say, complete, and we can sell it to others too, because then we know how it works. So who, who were those early partners? That is there any that you can mention? Yeah, I can tell you that Amazon was one early partner, actually. But Okay, not whole Amazon, but a part of it for sure. And HP, actually. HP, when we were really young as a company, they were building a small printer, this HP Sprocket. Maybe you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, you, you can uh, combine it via Bluetooth with your phone and then print images directly from your phone. And actually, they came to us and want to integrate our mobile SDKs in this case. And yeah, we really partnered and talked a lot of them in the beginning of, about features and what you need, like stickers and all that stuff. That's fantastic. So those are those are two big partners to start out with and help grow your product. That's sort of an opportunity that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, you're right. And we were happy about that. Actually, it was a bit luck, I told you. So we started on GitHub, we were found. So and then all went good for us. And until now, we are really lucky because we have a lot of inbound requests. It's not so much that we have to advertise our product, let's say, and go to, from door to door. It's more like people find us or find us integrated in other products and then come to us and find us via our webpage, etc. This episode is sponsored by Greenleaf Book Group. I learned about a new empowering and personable book that every female sheepreneur will love. From Cubicle to Cloud, How to Start and Scale a Virtual Professional Service Business by Jennifer Brazer. The book gives vital and empowering advice to entrepreneurs at all stages in their journey working to scale their business in a post-COVID world. Jennifer's experiences while building her company, Complete Controller, produced an essential guide for anyone wanting to create a cloud-based service business. Her business, which disrupted and reinvented Client Accounting Services, or CAS for short, is one of the first completely cloud-based accounting services in the country. Whether your specialty is accounting, therapy, design, law, or another field, Jennifer's book provides indispensable tools that will set up a cloud-based professional service for maximum success while sharing entrepreneurship dreams, nightmares, and lessons learned along the way. Are you ready to take your business to the cloud? From Cubicle to Cloud is published by Greenleaf Book Group and is available everywhere books are sold on January 26, 2021. But you can pre-order online now from your favorite book retailer. While you wait, check out Jennifer's favorite breakthrough exercise for entrepreneurs, the pen to paper at jenniferbrazer.com. Let's switch to team. Daniel, how did you build your team? And, and what I'm looking for is, what did you look for in those people to indicate that they were the winning horses to join you? Team is a really important topic, to be fair, and I can't emphasize that enough because you can't build something like that alone. 
So in the really beginning, we were really lucky because we were like working in this digital agency and there were already like 20 people working there at that time. So we had, a, had already a few people which we couldn't leverage in the beginning. And so we had people which were experienced with React, we had experienced with Android and with iOS. They were also kind of friends, you know, so it was really good to work with them. We could be really open to work with them. And, and up until now, I'm looking for people which yeah, are truthful to me and criticize also me and the other founder. Because you need people who are invested, who don't just see it as work, but they like the product, they want to have good quality in the product. So that's basically, I think, the key thing I'm looking for. It's for sure, technical skill is very important for an SDK because you have to really dig deep in all these details. But on the other, it doesn't help to have someone who's only really, really experienced in technical things, but it's not a good team player because then it doesn't scale really well. So what sort of team culture have you built? Um, you know, and, and I know you can't, just like you can't build a product alone, you can't build a team culture alone. Too. So what sort of culture have you created at Imagely? Yeah, first of all, I think the culture created itself. <laughs> I really believe in flat hierarchies. So there's nothing like that I'm like the, the boss there and I'm running around and telling people what to do. It's more like uh, we are a bunch of people which work together and want to bring out a good and very well-defined and produced product. I still take the time to even talk to the juniors and meet with them and like everybody, even we now have these meetings where we randomly uh, put people together from different departments so that everybody knows each other and they become uh, closer and know that they're working with people and not with some engineers or some sales guys, you know. So that's not for me. So for me, it's like it's a big team. So everyone is involved. So let's flip to scalability. So did you build this to scale efficiently from the beginning or is this something you were fighting as you grew? I would say fighting as we grew because in the start we were like three, four people at most. Yeah, it's you don't need uh, and the software, uh, we just need to get it out and get the features out for the customers. So we didn't think too much about scaling. But to be fair, from the technical part, so we are not a SaaS a software as a service or something. When SDK, that means we chip the software to the customer, they embed it. So we have no issues of scaling like service or something. We have only issues with scaling with people and team size and creating more at the same time. And that's what we just learned over time, how to do it properly over the last five years. What were some of the major lessons you took away as far as scaling people? Because that's a that's a different problem, right, than scaling software. And I hear that you don't you don't encounter that much because the customer is essentially shipping your product with their product. But how did what were some of the lessons you figured out with scaling team? The most important part is that the team functions as a, as a whole, which means that if there are people in it which may or may not like other people or there are some things in the team which are not nice or that, that, that will influence all your team members eventually. So you really quickly need to figure out what are the things inside your team which a side technology hinders them in working uh, properly, which also means that they have fun in their work and that they like to come and not argue with people and all that stuff. This is really, really important. And to be fair, these days, our onboarding process and our, uh, like, say, hiring process goes really deep and it's really long just to ensure that people fit into the company, which doesn't mean that they have to be equal to everyone. It just means that, yeah, they, they somehow culturally fit. So maybe it's important to know. So for me, it's much more important to have a good, effective team, maybe also a small one, depends how we define small, instead of having a hundred, a thousand engineers just for the sake of it. You know? Yeah, no, I totally get that. It's not efficient to have unnecessary people when you can have a, sh a small, effective team. And it's easier to maintain a team culture when it's small and effective like that, yes. too. There are many things which are easier with a smaller team. So as you step out on the balcony and you look across what you've built at Imagely, what are you most proud of? To be fair, the team. I'm most proud of the team, about the people we got into the team, etc. And I'll tell you why. The reason why is that, first of all, I like coming to work every day. And I think that most of our people are all do. And second of all, we have so many experts now. We are like kind of 30 people this, at this time, which are experts in all kinds of fields and which enables us even to, to build even more products, bigger products, larger products, which we might then again ship to customers and enlighten them with these new things, even apart from these SDK products we already have. 
When I was a student, I always took my fellow students, which I were nice and good for granted, but I learned quickly that having great people around you, kind of an effort and it's worth it. So let's flip the script a little bit then. Tell me about a mistake you made and how you and your team responded to it. Well, you always make mistakes, t mistakes in technology. <laughs> so I, I would refer to a problem we recently had, which is now pretty... Um, in the wild because you hear now from all these game developers which have sh are shipping products which have bugs in them and all that stuff and so we had a similar problem once so we were working on on a new ui for a long time and we had to postpone it several times because of several reasons and at some point i think everybody wanted to get it out and we didn't see anymore that there were still problems with it it wasn't at the same quality as the ui before etc but we kind of made the decision to ship it and I would never do that again because it has a lot of impact you ship it not everybody's proud of it and you ship it and a lot of customers are also not liking what they see because they have bugs in it and all that stuff so what I learned from it better ship later than just shipping too early if it's not at a certain quality point or maybe you could also decrease the features you want to have in it right was there any workflow or process changes that came out of that learning? For sure, we even do more, uh, let's say, writing. We write more down. We, we wrote things down before, for sure. We had a product planning before. But we got more deeply into the estimation part and how we work. So before we were doing, that's a long time ago, but before we were doing all this stuff like Scrum and we were like doing this planning poker and doing estimations, which turned out to be a bit more like a gut feeling of estimations and no real estimate. And we kind, kind of based our, let's say, our releases on that, which always fails or often fails. And these days we work differently. We kind of adapted concepts from Basecamp and other companies where we just define the goals for a certain sprint or a time and what we want to achieve in this time. And then yeah, we modify the feature set and just want to launch something in a certain time frame and focus on that one and get things done. And that works quite well for us the last years. So what does the future look like for the product and for your team? The crude feature about the PSDK is that we are, have released last year video editing SDK, which is basically photo editing are extended to everything you can do for stories, etc., like stitching videos together, changing the music and all that stuff that's on the SDK part. But these days, since over a year, we are working on a new creative tool, something like an InDesign competitor, to be fair. And that's our new game, and we will launch that during that year, probably, maybe in the beginning of next year. I'm not sure yet. And that's what we are currently working on, and everybody's really, really hyped about in our company. So if I hear that right, you're, you're taking on a part of Adobe. Is that correct? Yes. That's fantastic. That's a big goal. Yes, it is, but you have to have goals, right? And that's why I told you about the team. Once you have that team and you see what they can do together, you change your mindset also what's possible. And if you asked me five years ago, if I would, let's say, kind of try to get some, some users from Adobe, I would say, hmm, maybe not. It's maybe too hard of a problem. But these days, we have a really great team, right? And so you see, okay, you can do that now. You have the experience now. You have the people on board. And now you can tackle that problem. Well, who influences the way that you work, Daniel? A CEO, CTO, an architect, really, really any person. Name a person that you look up to and tell me why. So I'm not looking after a certain person because I think everybody has his pros and cons. For sure, I'm reading books from the Netflix founders, Elon Musk, even John Carmack from It Software, which is a totally different industry. But all these people have something in common, which I admire is their persistence. They, they have a dream, they go forward and they put the work in. And I think that's, that's what I'm, I'm looking for. So not maybe a specific person, but like say more their trait. Gotcha. So you're, so I hear you saying kind of more, you study a broad set of people and you focus on the traits of those people because no one has it all. Exactly. There are a few people which for sure are outstanding. You know, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, etc. Everybody knows them and they are praised everywhere. And I, I really like what they do. But still, there are sides of them which I don't admire so much. So it's with everyone, you know. But it's their attitude. Their, their attitude is great. So and they, they change the world, I would say. Or they changed it even with Steve Jobs. Or these days, Elon Musk or even underdogs. I would say underdogs because they are not so much in the media like Sebastian Troon. 
Sebastian Trun was working at Stanford, was a professor in Stanford, which was who was working on robotics. And then he later got into the DARPA challenge, you know, that challenge where they drove his autonomous cars through the desert. And he won that. After that, actually, he got into Google X and he was one of the early Google X, um, I wouldn't say founders, but leaders. And then he found also Udacity. He's actually one of the co-founders of Udacity and did a lot for autonomous driving. And I think these days he's, he's into autonomous flying. So he's really versatile. But he came from academic and really did a good job going into um, yeah, the business world and producing new products which weren't there at that time. So if you could go back to the beginning, what would you do differently? Or where would you consider taking a different approach? That's also an interesting question because I, I'm a believer that you have to do all these mistakes. Yeah, you can't, there's no shortcut in my opinion. So you, so in, in every situation where I've been, I try to make the best decision, which may or may not be the best uh, in the retrospective. So I haven't a certain moment where I say this has to be done differently. For sure, technology wise, there could have been different decisions. One example could be we decided early on to have our um, different different source code for our different platforms like i told you be uh, like we had an ios version in swift then the android version in kotlin etc which is a lot of overhead because you have to develop everything like three times more or less so these days i would do it differently and we are doing it differently these days with new products and have a shared code base from a technology standpoint and from this team standpoint i would always say and this sounds harsh um if people don't fit in the company, let them leave early and don't keep them just for the sake of it, because it has much more influence of the company than just this person, because it influences everyone if somebody's in a bad mood and all that stuff. Last question, Daniel. So you're getting on a plane and you're sitting next to a young entrepreneur who's built the next big thing. They're jazzed about it. They can't wait to show it off to the world. Can't wait to show it off to you right there in the plane. What advice do you give that person having gone down this road a bit? So I was always the one that wanted to do things quick and fast because for sure you want to show the world what you're building, etc. But I learned to be more patient at that things take time. Like I said, there are no shortcuts to learning. So you have to do mistakes, and but you have to be open to make mistakes. And making mistakes is nothing bad. So it often is regarded as that. I don't know why, but it's it's part of the learning process. And that's what I'm trying to, to tell everyone that I meet, even our, our new t- team members, that it's okay to make mistakes. It's just it's important to learn from them. That's, that's something I would tell everyone who's sitting next to me who needs some advice. So I wouldn't give advice when it comes to, like, say, raising money or something. So this is something you have to do and you have to be good at if you want to raise money. But eventually it's more about the persistence also. So it's building the product is a really important part. And there are a lot of hiccups in, in your road and you have to, even your roadmap will change all the time. So you have to have a vision, which shouldn't change too much, but it has to adapt. But the way to your vision that can change a lot during months or even years. So I would rather focus on the next step more than the step in two years. That's fantastic advice. Well, Daniel, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for telling the creation story of Imagely. Thank you, Noah. And this concludes another chapter of Code Story. Code Story is hosted and produced by Noah Laphart. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the podcasting app of your choice. Support the show on patreon.com slash code story for just five to ten bucks a month. And when you get a chance, leave us a review. Both things help us out tremendously. And thanks again for listening.